we don't take enough time to give praise and thanks to the goodness of God and how he's blessed us. And you know, tomorrow is Resurrection Sunday, and so it's okay to say God and Jesus and thank you and holiness. You know, you can do that. I just wish we could do it more often to give credit and praise to the one. Happy Resurrection Weekend, everyone. I'm Armstrong Williams, and thank you so much for joining us. Joining us on this edition, uh, Chef Daniel is in the house with his medical jacket on. We call it his chef jacket. <laughs> and he is, I mean, he is a superstar chef, and he has prepared the meal for this Passover this weekend for the Armstrong Williams Show. We have um, Dr. Gail Holness joining us. Bless Always you. a pleasure to have you. Pastor A.R. Bernard, you know, one of our favorites, my brother, Pastor A.R. Bernard, and Dr. Gregory Selfs in the house. Dr. Selfs, how are you doing today? Talk to us about, Pastor Bernard, you know I'm going to start with you, the importance of this weekend, the last supper, supper, dying on the cross. He rose and died for our sins so that we can have the right to that tree of life. Well, it's interesting, Armstrong, because the setting for Ramadan, for Passover, and for Good Friday and Easter Sunday is spring. Spring is about new life. It's about rebirth. It's about new beginnings, a new start. And that's the beauty of our Christian tradition because it's called Good Friday, even though it's remembering the death of Christ on the cross because it points to Easter Sunday, which is the resurrection, a new beginning. And it sends a message to us that we can begin again, that no matter what crisis we experience in life, we can make a new start. And I think that's important. Um, Dr. Sells? Yes. Um, do you think there is this, we, we hear all the time, that people want to talk less about God and talk more about man. And we talk about yeah. these spiritual illnesses, illness all around the world and how the world is in crisis. What do you think moments like this weekend? And, and I know people debate whether Easter is the exact time where Jesus, the moment in time he was crucified. That does not matter. We do know that he was crucified and that he, right. did, he did rise. Um, um, and so instead of getting lost in when and where if it did happen during that time. Talk about the fact of why the world need more conversations and recognition about what is really important in this little journey you call life. Well, I'll tell you what, not only life, but freedom, freedom to live life as God wants you to live it. And the Bible says in Galatians that it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. And if Easter's anything, it's not a religion. It's not you and me trying to get God off our back because God did that by dying on your cross in, in your place. And he gives you his life. So it's this proclamation that not only can you start again, but you can live a life now that's reconciled with God, that's redeemed with God, and that has resurrection possibilities to live eternally with God. And so it's really God saying, here's my offer. Here's my offer, world. And so you can go the way of man, but the way of man, all you got to do is look in the history books to see what the way of man is like. Or you can go this way because God has sent his son into the world to actually live your life, die your death, and give you his life as a gift. I, I'm telling you, it's, a, it's, it's not just Resurrection Weekend, it's God's offer weekend. You know, Pastor, hold, hold this. What is um, interesting is that not everyone shares the Christian faith. Many people don't see themselves as being religious, and some people see themselves as being agnostic and atheist. But the beauty of our Creator is that He does. Now, you know, Pastor Seltz talked about freedom. When I think about freedom, I think about free will. Absolutely. God gives us the freedom to reject Him or to accept Him. Exactly. And that's where we are. Even doing this whole, what we deemed was our Holy Week. We went from Palm Sunday to what we call Ash Wednesday and that some people call Spy Wednesday because Spy Wednesday was the Wednesday that we put those black things on our head when Judah um, betrayed Jesus. They call it Spy Wednesday. Then we had Monday, Thursday, where the washing of the feet and remembering where we are. And then Good Friday, Good Friday. How good is Good Friday when someone, but the goodness of it was that someone looked beyond our faults 
saw where we were going to be 2,000 years later and died on an old rugged cross for us on a, what we deem Good Friday. Someone that was counted out. And what this represents, this whole process represents, regardless of who you believe in or what you believe in, is that there's hope. There's, there's a, a sense of justice. There's a sense of freedom happening during this season. And then you have a resurrection of someone that was counted out. You counted out on a Friday. But then on Sunday morning, everybody remembers your name uh, 2,000 years later. And, and there's a scripture that says, at that name, not some, but every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. We, that's what we believe in. Everybody believes in something, whether or not they're agnostic, whether or not they're Christian, whether or not they're Muslim. We still believe that there is one God. And we've come through Ramadan. We, it's still in Ramadan, dealt with Passover. And Passover is not necessarily a Christian uh, religion. It's Jewish, where the Jews were getting ready for the Exodus. So we, there was this, this holy slavery. was powerful out of slavery. Mm -hmm. And who can relate to coming from enslavement than Americans of African descent? And would want to at least commemorate something as a Passover. You know, Pastor, it's, it's interesting because if you think about it, I've never really thought about it like this. Sin is slavery. Yes. Absolutely. 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 Jesus was very clear when he talked about enslavement to sin, where we are bound to those desires that are self-destructive and our, our impulses. Um, it is definitely the very slavery that he came to set us free from. And that's why it points back to the past, the Jewish Passover. That was physical slavery mm -hmm. that was liberated by the power of God. But now Jesus Christ brings the most important slavery, and that is the inner slavery when we are slave to our appetites, when we're slave to those things that are self-destructed. Uh, because that's really where it begins. Because you could be free on the outside and still in prison on the inside. And the, the greatest prisons are not made of concrete and steel. They're, made, they're the prisons of the mind, the prisons of the heart, where we are kept from experiencing our full potential. So, you know, I was thinking as Dr. Holdness was speaking about the, how, how going back to um, Palm Sunday, right up to Easter Sunday, and we, we see a, a, the reality of life, because on Palm Sunday, it was a celebration. The people thought that Jesus, the Messiah, was now going to come and liberate them from the, uh, from the Roman government. They saw, they saw him as a political leader, and there was celebration. Well, by the middle of the week, he was arrested. It was a, 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 a perversion of justice, the prophet Isaiah says, that got him to the cross because it was a fixed mock trial, and then the death on the cross. But after that, after a Saturday of silence, Sunday morning, the tomb is empty. He's risen. And that is life. We go through moments of celebration only to result in pain. And then after that, there is a rebirth, there's a new beginning. And I think that's a very important theme, no matter what your faith is, no matter what you believe. Absolutely. You know, you know Dr. Seltz, um, you know, what is often not discussed in this resurrection is that he died as a result of the original sin of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Yeah, I, I was going to say, you know, we talk about justice and we talk about mercy. And if you look at what the Bible says, the only place where real justice, complete justice and complete mercy happens is on the cross. Because there God actually takes upon himself humanity's sin, period. And then offers him, so he's he's justly punished in our place. But only it's only God in the flesh can do that. And uh, you know, so when God executes perfect justice, no one gets away with sin. And then He offers uh, incredibly merciful mercy, uh, which is what the good for, what Easter Sunday is all about. And people need to understand you know, this whole idea of justice and mercy. It's not what we think about it. It's what God thinks about it, and God makes it happen on Good Friday and on Easter morning. You know, Pastor Holiness, you know, you know, you know, I'm getting these epiphanies today. You know, sin weighs us down. Mm -hmm. It's a burden. We give names to it. We call it cancer. We call it depression. We call it heart attacks. We call it sickness. We call it all other, all kinds. But it all has to do with the fallen man. It has to do with the fallen man and the fact that 
it, it's boiling back down to mental illnesses that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, that it's occurring in a lot of our lives and you hear people talking about mental illnesses now but we have what is called free will and when you have free will there has to be some kind of self-control in the process of that free will understanding what your free will and how your free will may impact someone else's life mm -hmm. um, Jesus could have come down from that old rugged cross but he stayed. How many of us would have stayed on the cross for sinners, robbers, backbiters, people who committed fraud, people who acted out with inappropriate bad behavior, liars? You stayed there just, and for, and for those who were good, none of us are perfect, but stayed there. How many of us would give up our lives for freedom and justice? Now we know people who have done, who have died for us to, uh, Americans of African descent can point to people who, our legacy, our ancestors who died, that we might have the right to vote, that we might have the right to sit at the front of the bus and those kinds of social ills, but the right to the tree of life, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Not that we would be in soup lines, waiting for somebody to give us some cheese to stop us up for about a month or two but that we might have free will to do and, and to exercise that free will. Everybody can't um, be a speaker. Everybody can't be a doctor. Everybody can't be a lawyer. Everybody can't be a teacher, but find your gift where you are, where you fit in and allow the Lord. Your gifts will make room for themselves. You know, um, you know when, we, when we think about food, we think about Thanksgiving, we think about Christmas, but you know, that Last Supper was a family gathering, and there was food that they broke, the bread and the wine that they drank, and you know, it's Passover, but it's about family, and sometimes family betray each other. There's this seat at the family table that you cannot see, but you know, as a part of our celebration, and you can tell I'm excited today. It's my favorite topic, talking about the goodness of the Lord, is that you cannot have a conversation like this unless you talk about the Passover food. And that's why Chef Daniel Thomas will join us when we come back, and he's going to serve our guests. They're going to see just how well he can prepare that meal for <laughs> Passover when we come back. Right. And, uh, hey, happy Resurrection Weekend. And yes, he rose. And we'll be back. Chef um, Daniel Thomas, yeah. man, we've got the, you prepared this meal, but talk us about us about food and Passover and preparing the kind of food, because you know what, I've never had a conversation about Passover food until you and I had a conversation early in the week. Uh -huh. Talk about the Passover food. So, so there are multiple uh, aspects of food, especially when it comes to healthy living. And I like to talk about the diversity of food because no matter whatever your religion is, uh, you're going to be eating during this time, uh, whether you are doing Passover or whether you're uh, focusing on Easter. And so today I was so excited about talking about and bringing healthy food for people to try because I do focus on healthy living because, yes, our body is a temple. And so I want to make sure that we do not... Uh, go overboard during the holidays and small ways to just make small changes that make big differences in our lives so that we can eat healthier during the holidays so that we do not get overweight and we do not feel like, oh, well, I got to wait until the next holiday and I'll change then. And then we never change. So uh, so today I was excited about uh, bringing lamb, which is usually, uh, lamb is used more during pa uh, Passover time. The tradition is usually more lamb shank, but I did lamb lollipops today, 
which is more of a focus on smaller bite-sized portions that are still delectable, delicious, and take less time. But then when you look at the uh, Good Friday, we always talk about how the, the, the fish and the fried fish, and don't get me wrong, Lord Jesus knows I love me some good old fried fish, and I can tell you about all the fishes of the world, but today I wanted to do something different where I made it just as delicious, if not tastes better, because I wanted to focus on Chilean sea bass. And so uh, in their hand, she has a pan-seared, 12-season herb-crusted pan-seared Chilean sea bass topped with crab with some sautéed spinach, uh, sautéed with a little bit of curry, a little bit of turmeric for brain health, um, a little bit of uh, rare pepper flakes for diabetes. And then uh, the, the reverend also has, uh, for, you know, for the people for Passover, I want to show love, especially for people who do not eat shellfish or eat uh, fish. I wanted to make sure that we started with a pan sear uh, instead of a lamb shank. We're going with lamb ch uh, 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 lamb chops, and so I'm so excited. And that's also, also sautéed with spinach and a, a, a garlic mashed potato. That's still healthy, still delicious, and we're still taking care of everybody at the dinner table. Let me do one thing. You know, I grew up in a very God-fearing family. Pastor, bless the meal. So you all can eat. Let's bless the meal. Mm -hmm. Let's bow our heads and bless the meal. Father, Father, thank you for your provision in our lives, your guidance, your wisdom, your protection, your favor. Thank you for the opportunity to celebrate such an important season in all of our faiths. Thank you for food as part of your provision. We pray your blessings upon it as we receive it as hell to our bodies. In Christ's name, amen. 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 So, Go ahead, go ahead, so some of the flavors that they're going to experience as they take bites uh, is utilizing just herbs and spices that you even have in your uh, in your uh, your cabinet, in your pantry. Uh, herbs and spices such as that they use during that time, like rosemary and thyme. Um, mm -hmm. That when you pan sear it, I call it what I call LITF, which means lock in the flavor. So, oh, come on, the come on, Reverend. <laughs> <laughs> That's what so says it's good. And so, and so, <laughs> and to utilize, just take flavors. And so, I don't want you to feel like you're bloated during this time. I want you to feel like you can actually go and just take a walk. And so, uh, understanding how we treat our bodies, we we can't pray and then say, oh, Lord, bless this food that I'm about to receive, that it may strengthen the nourishment in my bodies, and then fill our plates up with so much food. We have to actually be reasonable with our bodies and loving to our bodies. And so because this is a time of love, I want to make sure that you love on yourself as well as Jesus loves you. And so that's why I'm making sure that they're fed healthy, but delicious and tasty, healthy food. So tell us a little about yourself, though. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, the short version is born and raised in Washington, D.C. Uh, I know I wanted to be a chef since I was three years old. The ladies of my dad's church used to sit me on a stool and talk to me like <laughs> I was a chef. I guess I was listening. I actually have letters in seventh grade on what I, what I wanted to cook for the president of the United States and also innovate food for space travel. After that, I had my first taste of cooking for the Power Elite at 14, cooking for the chairman of the Boeing Company, and then 16, cooking for the late and great Colin Powell. I then uh, focused on nutrition because my dad and my grandparents were uh, borderline diabetic, and I realized that we were not making the healthiest food in the church, at my dad's church. So I wanted to focus on that. I went to the Lewisburg College in North Carolina, did a program at Delaware State focused on nutrition, and then I graduated from the Culinary Institute of America in New York with my degree in restaurant, uh, uh, culinary arts with a focus on restaurant law and nutrition, and I finally got to live my dream of uh, being the chef for the U.S. Senate. Uh, cooking for not just one uh, president, but now living my dream of cooking for five presidential families, over 100 foreign heads of state, chef to the Senate, and now I get to cook for the amazing Armstrong Williams and his amazing guest today. So obviously my life has been lived, and now I'm working to innovate food for space travel as one of the first black chefs to keynote for NASA, where I am uh, taking food to the next level and also helping out black-owned businesses and utilizing my seat at the table. So a little bit, that's a little bit about me, um, especially I was a national spokesperson for AARP, showing the world how to live a healthier lifestyle for the 40-plus community. So I just love food, I love helping others, and I just want to just be an angel that God has called me to be for his people. You've cooked for five presidents? Five presidents through families. So I've cooked for, uh, when they came to the Capitol, I've cooked for the Bushes, I've cooked for the Clintons, I've cooked for the Kennedy family, the Reagan family. I've cooked for the Bidens, uh, 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 Vice President Kamala Harris, uh, the Obamas, um, numerous, uh, and sorry, fellas, but women do run the world uh, because I've got to cook for three Supreme Court justices, and they were all women, and hopefully soon, Kentaji Jackson Brown uh, judge Supreme Court justice uh, uh, in the near future. So, How uh, were you when you, when you started cooking? Because you look like a baby. 
uh, three years old, I started uh, in my church kitchen because since we're talking about church, I started in the church kitchen. So uh, uh, when I was three years old, but I've always wanted to be a chef. I cooked for my first president at 21 um, and have just been rocking out ever since. And so I just thank you for this time to just talk about the NASA food as Juanita trying to be shy. Bring up these napkins and knives. They need the wine. Come put up in here. <laughs> Don't no walk problem. in front of the camera. Walk behind the camera. This way. Yeah, yeah. Pass something to me. Just pass to me. You know, we do things. We're down there up here. You got to take care of our guests. I got to make sure they can eat and wipe all at the same time. There you go. There you go. There you go. Pass, pass this to pastor. Okay. So talk about the NASA and the food. Yeah. So 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 uh, so last year uh, they had what they call a Centennial Challenge program, and they asked me to be one of the uh, uh, the guest judges for that. But they asked me to come and talk about diversity and space food, and there's not a lot of diversity in space. And so last year. Um, they asked me to come in and I became the first black chef keynote for all of NASA where we talked about innovating. It, the title was called Nutrition is the Mission, a Taste of Soul on the Trip to Mars. So understanding in the, 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 the short version of this is that going to the International Space Station takes around, you know, three days going to the moon, you know, a, a certain amount of hours, so a number of days. Um, and it's just depending on where you are and where you're, you know, taking off from. But when we actually flip that around and we're starting to actually take new levels in space travel, going to uh, Mars, that's actually going to take about nine months. And that's in a perfect situation. There's almost never a perfect situation. So there's actually going to take, uh, I say, about a year. And then they have to. And so what foods do we have right now that are not filled with so many preservatives that last? Uh, my vision is to actually build the first restaurant in space and also create pods as we take that along um, and travel and go from having pods being dropped off on the trip to Mars so that when the, on their return, it, utilizing artificial intelligence, thermonuclearization, they're actually being able to start growing at certain different times that we utilize here on Earth and say, you know what? We want to start this to start growing at this time. So on their trip back, they can actually have foods growing during that time and actually take a break to have a different environment. Because wow. one thing that I want to let you know about, which is pretty fascinating, especially we talk about this, is that uh, when you go into space, you don't think about it, but you lose taste buds because everything that's inside of your body it, it, due to gravity is actually down here right now. Like right now they're eating and everything is going right down. But when you're in space, there is no gravity. So I actually have to make food and work with them to say, you know what, we want to make food a little spicier for that. And so during that time, we want to make sure that we focus on healthy living, but make sure that we have diversity and it tastes delicious. Come on, somebody. Pray. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Hold on. So you wear your NASA jacket, right? No, this is my jacket when I cook for senators, Congress, presidents, and foreign heads of state. And now us. But yeah, so hey, listen, I, my man, yeah, my man, yeah, it's a beast. But yeah, <laughs> let's go to uh, our pastoral um, guests and let them tell, look, no, just tell the truth. We're going to start with you, Pastor. I, I, I'm on. about to start singing, Jesus, <laughs> me, me, <laughs> the cross. Oh, is it? <laughs> this food is excellent. This really? Is, this is the fish uh, and the sea bass, mm -hmm. and it has spinach on it. It tastes like it has mashed potatoes under the bottom and these little leaves and things that you eat. It is <laughs> fabulous. Thank you so much. It's very healthy. I, I don't eat meat um, generally. Uh, I, I call myself, I'm at that point now, I'm strong. I eat what I want, when I want, uh -huh. when I want. But this, She's everything terrible. chef, yes. you are what we would call the magic chef. Oh. Mm. Pastor Bernard, little, little oh, let's, let's see what Pastor I, Bernard You know, I didn't expect lamb chops, but I love lamb chops, uh -huh. especially lollipop lamb chops. Mm -hmm. I love it as an advertiser. And this is well seasoned. Mm -hmm. When you can taste it as soon as you bite in, that makes a difference. And lamb, you know, you have to cook it just right. Because if it's too well done, it becomes dry. This is moist, it's tender, but what's getting me most is how the seasoning just really, really touch the palate of your tongue. Yeah. Before we say goodbye and turn to AI and other things on today's Easter weekend show, what is your secret? Uh, my secret uh, for food is just to love what you do. Uh, the way that these pastors uh, focus on and learn and continue to learn uh, uh, theology, I focus on food and learn food. And I just feel that God gave me a gift and I like to utilize it and I just continue to learn. I'm actually in school right now at Johnson & Wells getting my master's in uh, technology and food innovation so I can continue to help black owned businesses out because on, unfortunately out of the 70,000 items in the grocery store, less than seven are nationally black owned. So to focus on 
uh, today. Uh, it's just I have a knack for food, for people, and for how to tantalize their taste buds. And so a little bit of razzle, a little bit of dazzle, and that's why we're eating today. Uh, and I look forward to taking care of you again soon. Chef Thomas Daniel Charles. Thomas, Can I say one thing? thank you so much for joining us. Yes, go ahead. One thing, I'm from South Carolina, and when we have good food, Chef, we say, he put his foot in it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> almost. <laughs> <laughs> you put well, your foot in this. We're going to come back. Go ahead, Pass. Uh, this is excellent. It's really. excellent. I, yeah, I've tasted lamb chop. This is excellent. And you know what? I will tell you. I'm so proud of this man. Yes. What he has done with his life, what he's done with a gift that God put inside of him, and to discover it at such an early age, that's why he's successful, because he's living in purpose. Make room for your gifts. Let me give some love to Greg Massani and Aaron and WJLA Studio, the in, uh, National Dance staff, for making this work. Because a lot of this stuff unfolded at the last minute. But they are. My grand man, Greg Massani, is the master at making things work with no notice. But anyhow, Thank you, Chef. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Holder. Thank Cash you. Patel, John Long, Pastor Bernard, and I are going to return to talk about AI, baby, and much more. Don't go away on Resurrection Weekend. It is easier to build up strong children than to try and repair broken men. The streets are plagued with crime, violence, there's a lot of poverty, and it's all a result of lack of education that's happening in our schools. So it really is a crisis. We come from very different political perspectives, but we've come to the same conclusion, and that is there is a crisis in the classroom. Children are being deprived of quality of life because they're being deprived of a good education. We must solve this problem. It's incumbent upon all of us to join hands together to get this done. We can't afford to wait one more day before we address these issues because every day we lose another child. Let's stop the politicking. Let's stop the games. Let's really do something to give these kids a real chance at life and being a part of that American dream. We need accountability for funding. Uh, many of the districts where you're seeing very low test scores, um, you know, students graduating with very low literacy and math comprehension rates, they are receiving a lot of funding. So where is the money going where our kids aren't being adequately educated? If you believe every child is deserving of a quality education, please go to educationjusticefoundation.com. And welcome back um, to the broadcast. Pastor A.R. Bernard is still with us. Cash Patel, uh, former Chief of Staff for Acting Secretary of Defense, and John Long, co-founder and head of Quake Technologies. You know, we're here to talk about AI. I'm going to start with you, John, um, to talk about AI, the future of AI, the impact it's having, and what we should be, what are we really in store for? And what are some of the key advancements and breakthroughs in the field of artificial intelligence in recent years that encourages you, but also frightens you? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me here. It's always great to be on the show with you all. Uh, Armstrong, always good to see you. I always enjoy the quality of the conversation here. Um, personally, I'm in technology, so I'm very excited actually because I always think about what we can do with technology and not what technology is going to do to us, right? Because I think it gets it backwards, right? I think there's a lot of interesting opportunities. The future is going to look different and it's going to be a tech a future in which we can do more with less. Uh, in a democracy, I think these technologies are only going to democratize the ability of people to create businesses, to create new sectors of the economy. Um, will it be uh, challenging? Yes, the introduction of uh, any new technology produces challenges. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, I'd rather, instead of building a faster horse, I'd rather build a car. And I think these new technologies that are adding a lot of abilities in terms of advanced pattern recognition for doing things like generating speech um, are really powerful. Say, for example, for engineers, our country depends upon a lot of the rest of the world for engineering talent. 
a lot of times they're non-native English speakers. We're an immigrant country. And these uh, AIs allow them to communicate their intelligence in a professional manner even when they still are adult learners of a second language, for example. I think it's, it's very interesting and very exciting. Um, uh, Cash Patel, you're in this world of intelligence, and when you think about national security and you think about the drones and the technologies for militaries and fight against enemies, uh, what is it that really concerns you about this world of AI when it comes to warfare? Armstrong, it's great to be with you and uh, good to be with the panel. Uh, I agree with a lot of what John said, but from a national security perspective, uh, let's just, let me just say this as a former chief of staff of DOD, AI is critical to what we call asymmetrical warfare operations for the Department of Defense when we man against enemies like Russia and China in the cyberspace. That cannot be replaced, but it also cannot supplement human capacity um, when combined together is, in my opinion, the best way to go forward. In terms of the biggest threat, AI created by our adversaries like China and Russia, who don't operate with a law book or a panel of ethics or any care to human emotion and just want to reach their concluding factor, which is how do we damage America? That's our concern. That's why we've focused intelligence operations for so long against China and Russia, because they find unique ways to displace their algorithms, i.e. TikTok. It's not a complicated form of AI, but it's a manner of it. And they use that to call data that is private of not just American citizens, but also to tunnel into government systems. So that to me is where AI gets problematic, but it is, for American purposes, does serve a critical role in our national security interest. Pastor Bernard? Well, you know, I, I'm strong when it comes to AI. I, I'm excited about the benefits of it. I am uh, somewhat of a geek, so I've already uh, worked with uh, ChatGPT, OpenAI's uh, engine. And uh, there are moral and ethical concerns that I have, uh, and along with intellectual property concerns. And I'm interested to hear what your guests uh, have to say about this, uh, uh, the other panelists. Uh, on a moral and ethical level, uh, it's now a question of feeding the information because artificial intelligence simply takes the information that's fed to it or that it has access to and it responds to a query. So if we start feeding it, let's say false information, fake information, information that leads in a particular political direction, then AI is going to respond, those algorithms are going to respond by gathering that information and presenting an answer uh, to our query as though this information is, is true and factual. Uh, I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned about the fact that AI can write a paper, a, a, a dissertation, without citing sources. And in the process of gathering information from its database, it can actually plagiarize by taking information from uh, existing uh, authors and writers and making it, it, it its own. In fact, right now, there are some lawsuits that are currently in the courts because of this very issue. John Long, how do you respond to um, Pastor A.R. Bernard? I mean, I think those are all very valid concerns. Um, I think the major difference I have is about how I think of these technologies. I think it's common to think of them when they're doing things like the pastor referenced of generating articles, uh, papers that are meant to be written by university students. Um, we tend to think of these things as knowledge generation systems. And once we do, we start to worry about things like how truthful or not they are. I would actually challenge the idea that they're knowledge generation systems and think of them more as complex pattern recognition and pattern completion systems. It might sound like it's splitting hairs, but again, to go back to where how we actually see people using ChatGPT, the biggest use that I see, for example, in the business world is somebody's in a large company, they have a lot of written process, boilerplate text, and they have a set of bullet points that reflects their knowledge that they're not looking for the AI to generate, but they need to expand that into a professional sounding uh, memo within the business. So that is, I think, a fine example of technologies like ChatGPT being used as pattern completion or generation of a professional persona in an appropriate manner. Now, when it comes to the generation of false information in the context of politics, we've had a word for that for a long time. That's called propaganda. And I'll leave that to you, Armstrong. You're in the media landscape. I already feel like 
there's a lot out there. I mean, sure, uh, AI, chat GPT will be an efficiency tool for propagandists, but I mean, how much more uh, will the market tolerate? It seems pretty saturated already. Correct me if I'm wrong. Cash? Uh, yeah, look, AI is going to be a key uh, infrastructure node for our intelligence apparatus. And here's why. Let me give you an example. And, but it's also the same example will serve as a check on it. We in the intelligence community generate and collect so much intelligence data in the cyber landscape that we don't have the human capacity to digest it all. And where AI comes in in a useful way is to call through some of that with a smart algorithm to make sure we peak our national security terminology into it. But the problem, of course, is you cannot replace completely human power and manning hours against a set of intelligence collection completely with AI because in my opinion, that's still the best there is. But the problem is we just can't, don't have the manpower to call through it all. So there's like most other things in the national security space, not just AI alone, there's great benefits. There needs to be certain checks. And the pastor is absolutely right. The legal ramifications are something that needs to be explored for you know probably the next 10, 15 years to come as these systems get up and running. But we do, and I you know, just want to sort of footstop this, um, from an intelligence standpoint, we can't supplant uh, the human uh, skill set with uh, a complete replacement um, in the AI landscape. Pastor? Well, I, I, I'd also like to know, um, you know, the more sophisticated the query, the more comprehensive the response that you get from the algorithms in AI. But when it comes to ownership of intellectual property, so the algorithm is there, Right. And based upon my query, it gives me a, a let's say a written response, whether it's a dissertation, an article that I request. Who owns that article? It wouldn't exist if it were not for my query. So do I have part ownership in the intellectual property that comes out of those algorithms or does it strictly belong to the person who wrote the program? John? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think we're getting at some really interesting points here, ranging from, I think, yeah, right now there's so much data out there. Um, I actually think that these AIs that can do this sort of summarizing uh, of information that currently is only really able to be done by large companies, right? The ability in this big data age to distill information in a publicly available interface, I think is actually a very democratizing effect. And then to the pastor's uh, point about IP, uh, I, I think he's spot on. There's kind of a bigger issue at play here, which is what is knowledge? And one of the things that he was really hinting at is that a lot of our current concept of knowledge and intellectual property is a creative declaration of an individual. And I think one of the new skill sets, I don't know if you've heard of this term prompt engineer, right? There's already some businesses that are looking for people that are, you know, expert, although nobody's really expert at this, at, at dialoguing with these AIs, right? A lot of the creative output of this human in the loop AI system is going to be uh, reaped by people who are good at asking questions and engaging in dialogue. I joke with some of my friends who, uh, have philosophy degrees and aren't doing as well in the marketplace as some of my tech friends. And I say, hey, you all are trained in intellectual, intelligent dialogue. You might actually be welcomed into tech here very soon. Now, who owns that intellectual property? I don't have the answer to, I'm not a lawyer, but I agree with the pastor's concern that it is, how, who's gonna own knowledge and what is knowledge when it's in dialogue between a human and a machine? Uh, Cash, how do you respond to these conflicts and dilemmas? Uh, that it's going to be a whole new legal landscape for the mm. judicial process. You know, does the government own it? If it's a government bought algorithm from a private entity and we use it to query against individuals, then what happens? And let me give you an example that's current right now. One of our most sensitive collection tools in the FISA foreign intelligence landscape is this thing called 702 Collection. And it's up for reauthorization in Congress this year. What is 702? It was built so that we could collect uh, through the cyber capacities against terrorists overseas. But it was abused by the FBI um, as the pastor was talking about queries, where the FBI agents would query into the AI and algorithm and collect against American citizens unlawfully. Now, who owns that data? Let's put that aside. 
who accounts for the government overreach and the extended use of this AI and algorithm to unlawfully collect against Americans. So the legal process here and the judges are going to have a lot to decide. And more importantly, Congress is going to have to determine whether or not they reauthorize a tool such as 702. These AIs we're talking about do those things. And as a terrorism prosecutor, I'll be the first one to tell you I use 702 collection to safeguard this country from threats around the world. It's critical, but it's abuse is an example of where other abuses can occur in the AI landscape. And the only check we have on that is the court system in Congress. But unfortunately, those occur after the fact. Pastor, <laughs> your final thoughts on this? Well, I, you know, I, I, I think about how quickly we're adopting new technology. It took 20 years for us to adopt the internet and normalize it. When uh, ChatGPT came out, within a week, Armstrong, they had a million subscribers. Look how quickly we are, as a culture, adopting and normalizing new technology. It's going to happen so fast where we will have more knowledge than we actually understand. John, I'm going to give you the last word because I'm coming back to Cash to talk about an entirely different topic. John? Uh, yeah, just uh, it's been great being here. I mean, I think almost the conversation around this technology is as interesting as the technology. I just leave by saying that uh, ultimately the responsibility is on us to use these technologies in reasonable ways and to safeguard against people who do not. Um, I'll conclude by saying my company, Quake Technologies, we're developing technology for the fire service that leverages AI to help them do their job. We cannot be successful as a company unless we service this use case. Whereas most companies, if they come up with a use case that makes more money that doesn't do any social good, they have to do that by their fiduciary responsibility. We are hiring, we are looking to make an impact, and we are looking to show that AI can be used to save lives for the people who work hard in our communities. Thank John, you. John Long, thank you. Pastor Bernard, always thanking you for coming out, especially to being in the studio with us on this Resurrection Weekend. When Cash Patel and I come back, we're gonna talk about the Trump indictment, and much more on this Resurrection Weekend edition of the Armstrong Williams Show. As a home buyer, you need a lender who cares about your home ownership dreams. United Security Financial has been helping families secure their dream homes for 30 years. We're a national fair practice lender that provides affordable mortgages and low down payment programs to eligible home buyers. To learn how United Security Financial can help you secure your dream home, call 1-800-373-4186. Is it safe to say at this point that Alan Bragg may be Trump's biggest ally? <laughs> Since the announcement that Trump would be indicted, he has raised over $10 million uh, towards his campaign. With that number likely to ride in the future since his arraignment uh, for merchandise sales and public announcements. Obviously, Bragg is not in, out on Trump's side, but after the release of the indictment that even far-left critics of, have criticized as being inadequate and disappointing. It has become increasingly difficult to justify the huge expenses, hours, and humiliation of America on the world stage that it's caused for what are practically low-level crimes. This arraignment may have been the best thing that Trump could have asked for. The absurdity and inadequate charges against him have only emboldened his supporters and submitted his message that the establishment is really out to get him for no reason or any reason at all. Could Alvin Bragg have written Trump's reentry ticket to the White House? At this point, it seems there is near unanimous consent that the charges against the former president are disappointing and a complete political hit job. Even his harshest critics, CNN analysts, are stating and starting to question the allegations. Could this be Alvin Bragg's biggest misstep in political history? Cash your assessment of this past week? 
Hey, as a former federal prosecutor and public defender, probably one of the rare people in America to do both roles, my assessment is that it is a tragic display in 2023 of a two-tier system of justice. We've seen premiers from Mexico on down through other countries around the world that have committed uh, in public this week to say America can no longer lecture us on our judicial processes when your judicial processes are so flawed. And as an officer of the court, it pains me to say that they're right. We don't have the premier justice system in the world. And this case has now exemplified, and that's not a win for America. It's not a rallying point. It's a tragic day when law enforcement has become so weaponized, not just at the federal level, but now at the state level, that we are targeting people based on their political orientation. And when you see that play out with Donald Trump as a target, whatever your feelings about him are, the fact that everyone across the political spectrum is recognizing this law enforcement overreach is a costly day for American justice. When so many crimes, murders, shootings, armed robberies, drug trade are going unpunished, people in the streets of America are starting to notice these things. And we have a long way to go to fix it. What are the potential legal consequences you're being a former prosecutor for Donald Trump if he is found guilty on any of these charges in the indictment? Or do you think his lawyers would be successful in asking for the dismissal? Well, that's a great question. So I think, and I'm not the legal expert on this, this issue has never been decided. But what it says in the Constitution that even if Donald Trump were convicted of these charges, he could still run and be president of the United States. It's not the type of disqualifying crime envisioned by the founding fathers. It's certainly, this is why the founding fathers did not offer a mechanism to take down through the law enforcement process, a presidential candidate because they didn't want the law enforcement judicial system to interfere with the elections. As far as the motion to dismiss goes, what I would tell Donald Trump's attorneys is, do not file that motion to dismiss immediately. The American public deserves to know the evidence that Alvin Bragg has brought forth. The discovery process now begins. Get all the discovery you can, fancy word for evidence, and put it out there for the American people to see and read to themselves and, see and determine on their own whether Alvin Bragg has brought a righteous case. I don't believe so. But once that information has come in, and once you see the prosecutorial misconduct or overreach or hiding of exculpatory evidence, then the case gets even stronger to dismiss the case against Alvin Bragg. And I think that motion will eventually be filed. And I don't know that it'll be victorious at the judicial trial level, but I think from a legal standpoint at the appellate level, it will most likely succeed. How does the indictment cash of a former president affect the broader political climate on the world stage, and even the perception of the United States democratic institutions mm -hmm. around the world. That's probably one of the most glaring points that no one's talking about. And we, America, would always comment when other premiers around the world in other countries were charged and say, wow, look at the corruption. Look at the system of justice they have there. The difference here is that we have a case where we're not talking about corruption, we're not talking about legality, we're talking about political targeting. And to me, that's the biggest loss for America because I served in Democrat and Republican administrations. And when I was a prosecutor, we applied the loss to the fact and said, do we meet the burden of proof? A prosecutor's job is not to achieve convictions, it's to apply the loss to the facts and say, does it violate a federal statute or a state statute in this case? And we've gone so far astray from that with this creative legal uh, gymnastics that Alvin Bragg has entertained to bootstrap misdemeanors to a possible felony to a conspiracy he failed to define in his charging document. He doesn't define the crime that he needs to connect the conduct to to make it a felony. And other world leaders are looking at us and other countries are rightfully looking at us and say, no, America, you are not the shining beacon on the hill for justice and law enforcement you do not have the right to lecture us anymore. And from a diplomatic standpoint, for our commander in chief and others who are out there negotiating for America's national security interests, this only hurts us. It doesn't matter that Donald Trump's the target. It matters that our judicial system has been exposed to be severely flawed and two-tiered. And if you were 
Mr. Trump's counsel and advising him on how to conduct himself as this continues, what advice would mm -hmm. you give him? I think I would <clears throat> say to continue to do what he's saying about the two-tier system of justice. If you follow what his tenants have been in his public speeches for the last you know, six, eight, 10 months, he's been talking about how the system of justice has been weaponized or politicized, whatever verbiage you want to use. He keeps bringing up Russiagate, where I was, of course, the chief investigator, exposing how the FBI lied to a federal judge to unlawfully surveil a political target. He's talking about the flawed system of justice in the intelligence community combined when they leak classified information, well, whether it's during Ukraine impeachment one, two, Jan six, what have you, or the classified docs cases, he keeps hitting that nerve that America, this two-tier system of justice isn't just after me. The point is that it could be any one of you. And now it's at the state level where they are targeting Donald Trump yet again. So his ability to relate that to everyday Americans to say, I may be the target here, but you all could be the target next for either supporting me or publicly speaking out in my favor or subscribing to an ideology that the judicial officers, the DAs in this country disagree with. And that's what's scary to me more than anything else. But that nerve is, that essence is what Donald Trump, I think, is able to capture and that's why I think you've seen the boon that you talked about at the top of the hit here. You know, finally, in about 30 seconds, so you believe for most Americans, they think it's just more than about Donald Trump. It's about the deep state and how people can come after you and prosecute you and destroy your way of life and give you this great financial burden in defending this. And it's just it's not the American way. It's just not. And you don't have to listen to me about it. The fact that so many people <coughs> are following this case mm -hmm. and are re resonating it and saying, wow, I don't want this in my community. That shows you the effect that it is having throughout the landscape. And I think it's only going to grow as more and more misconduct is shown from Alvin Bragg's office. I cannot thank you, Pastor Bernard, Pastor Holness, Pastor Seltz, um, Chef Daniel Thomas, for joining us for this day's this edition. Happy Resurrection Weekend to you and your family. On behalf of all of us here at WGLA 24-7 and the National Desk, I'm Armstrong Williams. Thank you so much for joining us.